Hello, I'm Karen Wilmer and welcome to my presentation on varieties of English. Standard English has been a very difficult topic to make inclusions on as everyone seems to have different views and opinions, but it's been interesting to read about these different ideas and how the term standard English has been defined. According to Trudgill, 1999, standard English is by far the most important dialect in the English-speaking world from a social, intellectual and cultural point of view and it does not have an associated accent. So, if it is so important, and if it is, as he said, the variety associated with the education system in all the English-speaking countries of the world, and is therefore the variety spoken by those who are often referred to as educated people, then it would be interesting to find out some kind of definition which actually proved difficult. So, I stuck it with a bit more Trudgill to find out his opinion. He said that it is easier to say what standard English isn't, and he formed a characterisation rather than a strict definition. But the general consensus by many is that standard English is not actually a language. It is a language variety based on grammar, spelling and vocabulary and has nothing to do with pronunciation. But where did it come from? Well, the first evidence of any kind of standard English came from the Anglo-Saxons in the mid-15th century and, according to Hogg, has been constantly changing. He said immigration into London in the early 14th century brought people first from the home counties and East Anglia and then from further afar, all bringing their own dialects from their own counties. Hogg said Haugen suggested that standardisation must meet four criteria selection, codification, elaboration and acceptance. Standard English was selected because the seat of government was in London. It was codified partly through printing, for printers required settled forms, and partly through education, as the new middle classes demanded an education in English rather than in French or Latin. Its elaboration was a result of its quick spread through all the written discourse, and not merely the language of government. These three effects then led to its acceptance as the usage of educated people, at least in formal situations. Since then it has evolved, and today it is still evolving, however its grammar, spelling and vocabulary are what today is defined as standard English. Proof it is still evolving, according to Hogg, is the glottal stop at the end of words, particularly common in younger speakers. For example, hot becomes hot, or mid-glottalisation such as Gatwick. However, he does back himself up by saying this could be a feature of estuary English, a different variety, as standard English remains as hot or Gatwick in written English. Hogg also recognises the loss of singular and plural versions as the, of the personal pronoun you, whereas some other varieties have distinctions such as you guys in American. Hudson said, roughly speaking, standard is the kind of English which is written in published work, spoken in situations where published writing is most influential, especially in education and especially at university level, and spoken natively at home by people who are most influenced by published writing, the professional class. He also said that the most common non-standard usages in the UK are the subject-verb agreement, the formation of the past tense and the formation of negatives. He suggested the difficulty of codification of standard English and that it's easier to focus on other varieties and non-standard English to describe standard English in itself. This links back to a very useful quote from Trudgill, who said, If standard English is not therefore a language, an accent, a style or a register, then of course we are obliged to say what it actually is. The answer is as at least most British sociolinguists are agreed, that standard English is a dialect. Standard English is simply one variety of English among many. It is a sub-variety of English, sub-varieties of languages are usually for, referred to as dialects, and languages are often described as consisting of dialects. Which brings me on to my next topic, the variety of English known as New Zealand English. My choice of New Zealand English as a variety of English to discuss came about as I sat baffled at my laptop, wondering which variety of English I knew most about. I was convinced that most people I know don't actually have much of an accent, and I wouldn't really say that they spoke a variety of English. But I looked at my Skype window and realised that I had an American, a Kiwi, a native Italian and a friend from Derby, and realised that they all speak different varieties of English, but it's not something I'd really thought about before. So as if he could read my mind, my Kiwi friend, who I lived with in New Zealand last year, messaged me and we had a whole conversation about language varieties. What started out as a battle of the hemispheres turned into a very interesting history lesson of colonisation and Lord of the Rings and flip-flops. New Zealand was actually the last inhabitable landmass in the world to be colonised and as the most recently established variety of English, it is the only variety recorded from start to present. The Polynesian ancestors of the Maoris arrived in New Zealand pre-1200 AD and then the first English-speaking settlers arrived in 1792. Elizabeth Gordon from New Zealand's U University of Canterbury called it a mixing bowl due to the settlers bringing their own accents and varieties into the pot. Settlers arrived from Australia, Britain, Ireland and America during the early 19th century, called Pakeka to the Maoris, 
But after British and Maori chieftains signed the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi, the founding document of New Zealand, huge numbers of people came from Britain and Australia, soon outnumbering the indigenous Maori. So, in this mixing bowl, we already have Australian English, which is actually derived from southeastern England dialects, alongside Scottish and Irish varieties of English, and then the received pronunciation English thrown in there. But its uniqueness came from Te Reo Maori, the Maori language, which the settlers picked up when they had no words of their own. New Zealand English, Australian English and South African English carry similar dialects as they were settled around the same time, with links back to Southeastern English and received pronunciation. Also, it has to be noted that New Zealand remains a more equalitarian society than most Western nations, so it lacks social classes with varied social dialects. Vocabulary. There are many differences to standard English vocabulary which are usually used in casual speech, where the standard English terms are used in more formal speech. So, for example, cell phone in New Zealand English is a mobile phone in standard English. Dairy in New Zealand English is a convenience store. In jandals, flip-flops, jodder bar, speed bumps, togs, swimsuits and tramps are actually hiking. Other words were borrowed from the Maoris where the early settlers had no words of their own, particularly when it comes to farming, animals and plants. But there are others, such as kia ora for hello or kai for food, which everyone readily recognises over there. Some Scottish colonised areas, for example in Dunedin, Scottish terms are often used such as we for little or to do the messages for to go shopping. It was the Heinemann New Zealand Dictionary published in 1979 which first published terms found in New Zealand English but nowhere else. Even more recently, Lord of the Rings terms have come out of New Zealand too, such as Middle Earth. Phonology. In New Zealand English, the biggest vowel difference is that of short I sound you hear in sit. The Kiwis use it as an E sound you most likely hear at the end of the. Excuse my accent here, as I'm not very good at it, but the best example is that of fish and chips, a big debate between Aussies and Kiwis with whether they are saying fish and chips or fush and chips. The short A and bat E vowel sounds in bat and bet often sound like short E and I sounds to standard English speakers who hear pat as pet and pet as pit. A pet cat can therefore sound like a pit cat, or pens can sound like pins. As in Australian English, some New Zealanders will pronounce past participles such as groan and thrown with two syllables. And starting vowels are often pronounced with an onoglide, such as the name Andrew, sounding almost like endro. Another notable difference is that double vowels are rounded. So double E sounds often more la- sound more like I, such as in tree, sounds more like try, or fleece, sounds like fleece. Double O become an ER sound, a bit like gurday instead of good day. Finally, particularly for the younger New Zealand speakers, this little difference between ear and air sounds, so bear can sound like beer, and cheer sounds like chair. There are also some segmental features of New Zealand English involving intonation, stress and rhythm. The main feature is intonation, because we often hear Kiwis using this rising intonation at the end of their statements, sounding as though they are asking a question when they're just adding emphasis to the end of their sentence. This can often be heard in Canadian and Australian English too, or what's commonly called Californian Valley Girl speech, but is thought to have originated in New Zealand and is one of the defining features of the variety. Stress is also sometimes different, such as the verbs to import or to protest, where the stress is usually on the second syllable. It is usually found on the first syllable in New Zealand English. Also, in colloquial speech, Kiwis just use she instead of it as the subject of the sentence. For example, if a car breaks down, they will be use she'll be okay. More recently, up until the 1950s, Kiwis were trained to speak with a received pronunciation accent, particularly for newsreaders. More recently, though, New Zealand English has become more acceptable. However, from 1984 to 1999, New Zealand imported up to 80% of its TV programmes from America, Britain and Australia, with less than 20% of programmes featuring a New Zealand accent. Age dropping was very common in New Zealand English in the 19th century, but since the 21st century, this has all been wiped out. New Zealand is a usually monolingual country. Bell and Holmes in 1991 estimated that it was likely 95% of New Zealand spoke English with 90% monolingual in English. However, a wave of Asian immigration from mid-1980s has diluted this, and English monolinguism is now estimated at around 85%. The tag word A cannot be missed out when talking about New Zealand English, which is often found added to the end of a large proportion of sentences. There is nothing more eagerly recognised by New Zealanders as a marker of their identity than the tag particle A. Originating from the young working class British descendants and indigenous Maoris, research has revealed that A is a device used to establish and maintain a group identity. Finally, there's all the recent lexis and vocabulary developed from the extreme sport tourism New Zealand is fav- famous for, particularly surrounding the South Island. Sweet as, sup bro, are just some of these developments.